Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. Um, this week has been an interesting week, and I'm glad that you're here to join us as we come together to to praise God and to, to thank Him that even in the midst of hardship, we can find rest and solace and extreme love in His presence. Um, I know for some of you maybe that are, are listening to me this morning, you're struggling with the school system shutting down and going virtual. Um, for a lot of us, we struggle with the fact that we continue to do these services virtually instead of being in person. Um, to be honest with you, it is blowing my mind as to how bad Liberty County, um, if that matter, the state of Georgia is being hit by COVID right now. Again, we used to talk about having concerns of numbers of 100 or 200 cases per 100,000 in the county. And now we're looking at numbers that are quickly approaching 2,000. So I want to speak to your heart right now. There is a lot of things that we can do to help prevent us from physically getting sick. I pray that you are wearing a mask when you go out and about to be able to, to help protect those that are around you. I pray that you have, if you haven't already gotten uh, the vaccine, then I pray that you do. Um, and quite honestly, it's not even experimental anymore, at least for one of them. It's been fully approved now. And so I hope that you go out and you'll make that effort. But I also want to speak to you about your soul and about your spirit and about your uh, mental well-being this morning. This, to me, is a big part of all that, us coming together to worship. But I pray that you find other ways, too, that we're not all just kind of locked up in our homes, as it were, even though we do spend a lot of time in our home right now. I pray that you're able to get outside and go and do, and that you're able to find safe ways to be able to not go insane, honestly. The stress and pressures of this past few weeks have been great for many of us, whether you're in the teaching profession or you're in the healthcare profession, or if you're just sick and tired of COVID. So keep your spirits up. Continue to find ways to be able to celebrate God and to celebrate each other. Find ways to get outside and celebrate this wonderful world that we live in. Um, speaking of stress, this week we're going to do something a little bit different or maybe go back to doing something uh, that we did in the past for our children's service. Um, and But I do want to make sure that you understand that this does not mean that um, the, Miss Rebecca is gone for good. Um, I think she'll be back to join us again next week. And we appreciate all the work that she's doing. And I can tell you from my position, not just the work she does for the church, but the work that she does for her students and for her school as well. So as we serve, as we go through the service together, as we worship together and love Christ and love on each other, let us do so with a heart full of joy and gladness um, because today is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be thankful in it. Yeah. 
If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will hear, heal their land. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. This morning as we come together to pray, I just want to point out that, um, as one person put it, we have a lot of grieving going on in our uh, in our family, uh, not the Ryan family, but in the Fleming family and the Liberty County family, we um, you're going to see that our prayer list has actually gotten shorter, and unfortunately, it hasn't gotten shorter necessarily because um, a lot of physical healing has been taking place. But we do celebrate the fact that the people that were on here there no longer that we're going to pray for their families in just a few minutes have experienced the greatest healing that can ever be offered. Um, and we pray that they are finding comfort in the Father's arms and in the physical presence of Jesus Christ. We come together today to pray for those that have health needs and concerns. We pray for Betty Rogers and Candy Rogers, for Cassie Niles and Cheryl Brett, for Clay Godley and Craig Megan, for Dana Riching, for Dean Carter, for Dolores Merchant, for Faye Bowen, for Heather Torres, and for Jan Waters. We pray for Jeff Anderson and Jennifer Dean, for Jessica Bland, for Jesse Jones, for Karen French, for Kinsley O'Berry. We pray for Kyle and Patricia Medina, for Lacey Straley, for Linda Stephen, for Lori Smith. We lift up in prayer Luke Thompson and Lynn Bigby. We pray for Marie Elena and Marilyn Crowley, for Mark Manning, Melanie Collins, for Berta Ryan, for Robin Smiley Shubtrine, for Rodney Riley, for Rufus Clark, for Vilvin, for William Gilbert. We also pray for those that are bereaved for the families of Shirley Bean, Derek Wynn, Roxanne Galbraith Knight, Carol Rondu, Carol Landrum, and for Penny Mahoney. We pray for our shut ins Jackie Eaton, Margaret Beasley, Margie Crowley, and Coleman Sharp. We pray for those who serve in the military and their families. We specifically lift up in prayer those families of the 13 service men who gave their lives, service members, excuse me, that gave their lives in the protection of those that are in need. We pray for the people of Haiti. We pray for the people of Afghanistan. We pray for our health workers, our doctors and nurses. 
We pray for our law enforcement officers, for our firefighters and for our paramedics. We pray for our teachers and for our students, for those that are imprisoned, for those in spiritual distress, for our leaders. And I ask that you would pray for me, your pastor. We pray for those suffering from forest fires, for those affected by the recent hurricanes, for those unnamed and unknown. And we lift up a special prayer this morning for those uh, that are in the path of the hurricane in Louisiana and the areas around it. We lift up these prayers because we know that not only does God hear them and know our need, but he is actively involved in our lives and those whom we love. We know that not every decision that is made by God is one that we would hope for, but it is one that we accept because we realize that God knows best. So together, as a community of faith, we pray the prayer that Jesus Christ taught us to pray by praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
in the river I'm find life beyond compare He is calling He is waiting Jesus longs to meet you there Jesus longs to be you there. Take my hand now, lead me closer. Lord, I need to be you there. Science is amazing, but there's always going to be a conflict when it comes to science and God. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas, and I've been talking a lot about why we can trust the Bible. And I've also been talking about reasons why people say we can't trust the Bible and, and me kind of explaining why those reasons don't really make sense. And one of the reasons why people say that we can't trust the Bible is because they say it's just a bunch of fairy tales, right? Like they'll say that, that maybe some of the stuff in the Bible happened, but like the miracles found in scripture were clearly made up. And these days there's a big thing where people say that it's like science versus God. And if you're going to believe in science, then you can't believe in God because science is against God. Which for me kind of puts me in an awkward situation because I think science is amazing. I would love to grow up someday and be an astronaut. Science and technology have done so much for modern life. It really is incredible, like, like the scientific and technological advances that have been made in my lifetime, like they, they just blow my mind. And I think that science can solve a lot of problems. And I think that totally disregarding science, totally getting rid of science is a bad idea. I really do think that science, when it's done well, is sort of fulfilling that command that God gave to Adam and Eve, you know, the very first people. He said, go and, and be fruitful and multiply, but also to, you know, subdue the earth. God, God wanted people to take care of the earth. And I really think he wanted us to learn about the universe, about creation, about all the stuff that God made for us. And that's what science is. It's the study of the natural world. Or as a Christian, you might say, it's the study of creation. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I do think it's kind of silly when people say that science is against God, especially like atheistic scientists will say that. And so when somebody who you know, really highly values science but does not highly value God, when they see the miracles in scripture, they say, oh, well, that's just silly. That's nonsense. That's made up. Because it's not in line with what we see in nature. And my response to that is, well, yeah. Of course miracles aren't what we see in nature. If they were, they wouldn't be miracles. The truth is that science really should not have much of anything to say about God. Now, I do believe that the world, the universe, all of creation is filled with evidence that points us to God, that, that suggests a creator. And not even just a creator, but the one true God. But you cannot measure God. You cannot scientifically explain who God is. You can't draw a line around God. Science cannot contain God. Because again, it's the study of the natural world. And it has always been true, it's always been the case, that God is the creator, not the creation. The truth of the matter is that it all comes down to what you choose to believe, right? It all comes down to faith. Either you believe that there is a God or you believe that there is not a God. Science cannot definitively prove one or the other. Again, I believe that there are scientific clues all over the place that point to God. The Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the Bible also says that God's divine nature can be clearly seen through what has been made. But again, that's not really quite scientific proof. God is beyond nature. God is the creator. He's not the creation. Creation tells us about God, but it is not God. Science can never contain God. And the atheists who believe that there is no God, and they believe that the only thing that's real is what we can test scientifically, they too have no concrete evidence that God does not exist. We're in the same boat. 
Now, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every single person ever will come face to face with their creator and there will be no doubt. But here and now, doubt is an option. Unbelief is an option. We can choose whether we want to believe or not. But it's silly to say that the people who believe in the Bible have faith and the people who don't, don't have faith, don't rely on faith. No, they do. The difference is that we believe that there is something beyond nature, and atheists believe that there isn't. The fact that there are miracles in the Bible does not prove that the Bible is not true. It just proves that if there is a God, which there is, that he does not obey the laws of nature. God isn't the greatest thing in the universe. God is the greatest, period. He is beyond the universe. And I don't think he's ever claimed to be anything otherwise. It all comes down to faith. Do you believe that there is nothing above science? Nothing above what we can see or measure? Or do you believe that beyond what we can see or measure, there is a God who made it all? I firmly believe that the Bible is not a bunch of fairy tales, but that it is a true-to-life account of the Creator interacting with His creation in a way that science could never hope to explain. You can trust the Bible. Praise you with 
Our scripture today comes from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they, came from the, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other practices and traditions such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? 
Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of their body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Let us pray. Father God, as we come to you this morning, we pray, Father, wherever we might be right now, that your Spirit would renew us, would allow us to listen with ears, Lord God, that can hear you. I pray, Father, that you would shake the words that I might say and change them to be the words people may need to hear, because, Lord, right now, we need you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So i got a pop quiz for you folks out there. Uh, Rebecca, I think, will do well at this one. It's for you history buffs especially. So what is something declared illegal about 100 years ago, but it's perfectly legal today? Um, I'll give you a hint. It inspired the 18th Amendment to the Constitution in what was termed the Noble Experiment. The United States government made it a crime to manufacture, transport, or sell alcoholic beverages. From 1920 to 1933, a period referred to as a Prohibition Era, all the bars and saloons and liquor stores in the nation shut down. Or did they? Instead of ending the practice of drinking, the 18th Amendment drove it underground, in some cases quite literally. One example of this can be found in the city of Los Angeles, California. While law enforcement and government officials pretended to stop the flow of liquor in the city, underneath the city there were 11 miles of service tunnels that became secret passageways to hidden saloons. In fact, it's said that the mayor of Los Angeles at that time helped to supply illegal liquor to those hidden bars. By 1927, seven years after the past 18th Amendment, there were approximately 30,000 illegal saloons or speakeasies in Los Angeles. Twice the number of legal bars that have been operating before the law was passed. And in fact, even if you go down to Savannah, you can see some examples of what was going on during that time. Now, it would be easy to laugh at that type of hypocrisy. The um, problem is, is that it's still going on today. Obviously not with alcohol. I want to give you an example. Um, again, kind of thinking about what's been going on for the last year and a half, right? It's kind of hard to escape COVID. How many times have we heard of people, politicians, leaders, that have told us one thing while operating a completely different way? There was a, one example that I can think of off the top of my head of a mayor of a city in Texas who um, had sat there and recorded this video that was shown and it was um, it was put out on Facebook if I remember correctly and, and in there he kept telling people you know stay home if you can um, you know don't go out uh, stay in your your homes all this good stuff uh, which a lot of leaders have said and there's certainly nothing wrong with that um, the, in fact right now I know that Mary and the girls and I are spending a lot more time at home right now than we are in other places the problem was it came to light that he had recorded the video when he was on vacation in Cabo San Lucas in Mexico. He's only one example of that. I, I know that um, even us, as we make decisions about what we're going to do in our lives, we think a lot about how that would play out, what the optics of, our, of that are. Now, we love to roll our eyes at people that get caught at doing things that expose um, themselves as being uh, you know, hypocritical. But we all have problems, I think, with morals sometimes and ethical consistency. We all fail to meet our own standards, at least at times. It's not an excuse. It's a reality. Somehow um, our uh, hip, uh, how I would say that, um, uh, Somehow, our own radar, how about that, fails us when we point to ourselves. You know, when, when we start thinking about whether or not we're being hypocrit uh, hypocritical, whether or not, that's a hard word, whether or not we are um, doing that which we say actually in our own lives. It's especially difficult for church leaders, right? 
Um, now, I want you to remember, though, when we start thinking about what a church leader is, in my opinion, anybody who calls themselves a Christian and follows Christ, a Jesus follower, you're a leader because other people are looking towards you. Other people are seeing you and making decisions about how they're going to follow God or, or how they're going to follow Christ, or for that matter, not follow by how they look at you. Uh, the fact is, is that, honestly, um, we've got to be careful about us as leaders and what we do. I I've talked about this before, right? Um, about how many folks we've seen, televangelists, uh, people that, I even mentioned this a sermon a, a month or two ago about seeing a, a fellow pastor who had some designer clothes that were pressed and all this stuff uh, for him to be aware um, that tried to make himself look like one of the people, but in reality, what he had was not one of the people. Um, there have even been people out there that have done these like these investigative uh, whatever things on Facebook and YouTube and stuff. They're showing preachers that are wearing clothes that cost thousands of dollars while they preach about helping the poor. Uh, the fact is, is that the optics of that, the, the visibility of that, what that says about us really doesn't say much good, right? The great sin in this scripture, the great sin of the Pharisees, was their hypocrisy. The fact is they loved the law more than they loved God. They cared more about keeping religious rules than knowing and honoring God. They said all the right things. They taught all the right things. But they honestly just weren't motivated by a heart of God. They set a standard for others that they honestly did not live up to themselves. This Bible has a good example of Jesus' tough love to them. Because the fact is, is that hypocrisy, it, it's pretty poisonous. You see... How many people do you know that have told you they don't come to church because Christians um, are full of hypocrites? How many people have you known that have used that as an example to move away from the church, to leave the church? Because the people they saw operating around them just were not people that were showing the love of God. Even, honestly, in our own church, it has been easy at times when we have seen or heard somebody say something or do something for us to scratch our heads and say, that's not what we're supposed to be about. And if we are having such a hard time, people of the church, living God's will and doing God's will, then what does that tell others? And quite honestly, why would they want to become part of something that is honestly as bad as where they're at right now. The problem with the Pharisees is their hypocrisy was driving people away. And I would tell you and say that the problem with hypocrisy in the church today is exactly the same. I can tell you that how people think of us and what they, how they consider us makes a huge difference about how we can preach to them. And by preach to them, I don't necessarily mean sitting in a pulpit or in a chair in an office. I mean how they see from us what it means to love God. The fact is, is that because the sin of the Pharisees is our sin as well, we say we follow Christ, but all of us, right, fall short of that fall short of living the way that Christ lived. Christ says, you have let go of the commands of God, and you are holding on to human traditions. In other words, most of us are satisfied to live according to the standards of society, and yet Christ offers a higher standard. Um, I, I read a story that talked about this guy that went to his pastor, and he said that, that he was really um, upset because... Um, his, his child had kind of moved away from God, that, that you know, he believed that if, if he brought his children up in the church, that they would stay in the church, that they would be part of the church. And he said that he realized too late, apparently, 
that he had raised his child in church, but he hadn't raised his child in Christ. Sometimes we do this. We, we, we make following the rules and, and doing what we're supposed to do in church more importantly than living and loving and showing a relationship what that means with Christ. And our kids see that. And, and others see that. I, I can remember when our girls first started understanding the idea of speed limits. And once they understood that there was a rule about the speed you should go, constantly from the back seat, we would hear, Dad, you're going over the speed limit. Mom, you're going over the speed limit. You see, it was important to them, not necessarily what the rule was, but that if we said it was the rule, that we followed the rule as well. Jesus says that um, we're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. He tells us that that's the first and greatest commandment, and then the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Of course, that comes from the 22nd chapter of Matthew. Jesus is saying God isn't pointing you toward the law. The law is pointing you toward God. Once you understand God and submit your life to him, once you love God more than your own life, then you won't need the law. Instead, your goodness will be replaced by godliness. So I want you to think about that. I want you to think about how people understand and learn about God. I want you to think about some of the great medieval cathedrals that are built, like Notre Dame in Paris. Um, I want you to remember that most of the population in Europe at the time were illiterate. They didn't know how to read. Most of them would never pick up a Bible. And yet, on the sculptures and carvings and stained glass windows, the art that they saw within these magnificent cathedrals taught them Bible, taught them scripture, taught them about falling in love with God. And they learned that through what they saw, not what they read. When I was at Union, um, they were redoing their inside their sanctuary. And for a long time, before the stained glass windows came in, we were preaching and we had the, these glass windows, just, just the temporary glass, I guess it, it was, that was in there. And it, it was amazing because the light was streaming in. And I'll be honest with you, there were times I'm like, Man, I'm not, in some ways, I'm not looking forward to the stained glass even being put in because it's just such great light to come in to remind us of, of the light of the world. And, and it, was, it was cool. Well, when the stained glass windows came in, and the way they were designed is they literally told the story of Christ's life as you started on one side of the church and worked your way through the other side. Wow, it was magnificent. It was almost like we were being surrounded by the biblical story while we celebrated the biblical story. Actually, it wasn't like that. It was that. You see, we were able to understand and learn about Jesus, not just in what was being preached and what was being experienced, but what was being seen. The fact is, is that Early Christians understood the best way to spread the news, the gospel, wasn't necessarily through spoken word. It was through what people saw and what they experienced. You see, the best way to defeat the sin of hypocrisy is to move our testimony from our lips to our life. We can't experience the abundant love of, and life of Christ that, that he is promising us without living with the same heart that he exhibited. Arthur Brennan and Manning wrote this, The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Yo, you know that we have all experienced this. 
I think I've shared with you stories before of times that I've walked out of church and walked up behind someone to talk to them and heard them talking on the cell phone with words that would never want people in church to hear them say. And their embarrassment, and they turned around and they saw me standing behind them as if God didn't see it, as if God didn't know about it. The fact is, is that we've got to live in the same way that we say you should live. It's not enough to say follow Jesus. We have to live like Jesus lived. I want you to think about this last month of your life. I want you to think and, and kind of examine your life in light of the insights I've talked about today. In the past month, have you always lived your life like Jesus did in your actions, your attitudes, your priorities, and yeah, even your motivations? Were you motivated to do what you did this past month because of Christ's love or because of some other reason? Did you always present the message of Jesus in its purest form? Did you emphasize love in everything you said, thought, and did? And even as those words come out of my mouth and I think about how I acted this past week, stressed out and, and uh, angered about things how, uh, that had happened and how, um, how I reacted to that, and I'm deeply embarrassed by it. Did you emphasize love in everything you said, thought, and did? No, I, I didn't do that. Now understand that as I ask these questions, this isn't a test of some sort. This isn't a quiz. This is your life. This is your calling. This is your legacy. How do we get an unbelieving world to believe? William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, was once asked the secret to his success. I love his answer. His answer was that, that he honestly knew that he wasn't the greatest of anything. He said he knew people had, uh, that were more intelligent than him, had greater talents than him, were even given greater opportunities than him. But the difference for him was is that he decided that he would give all that he had to God that Christ would own all of William Booth, all that he was. And that once he realized that if he devoted everything he was to Christ, that's how success came. God can use everything that we have. He can use our intelligence and our charisma and our energy and our skills to share his message with the world. And all those things are very useful for God, but they aren't essential. The only essential thing that God needs from us, the only thing that, that is required from us, is simply our commitment, our willingness and total desire to love God and to serve God with everything we have. That's what makes us effective. That's what makes us authentic and persuasive witnesses, more so than any part of proper religious behavior. Will Campbell was a Baptist pastor and civil rights activist. He passed away in 2013. He was known for his love of the poor and for putting his faith into action, even when it required great sacrifice. One Sunday, he was preaching at Duke University Chapel. And I storm, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, I've been at Duke University Chapel. It is a beautiful and wonderful chapel. And I wish I could, I might try to throw a picture up. But I just want you to think about sitting in a chapel and that you can look out and you can just see the 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 outside as snowstorm had come down and I bet you it was beautiful and I imagine it would be incredible to preach with that background behind you as you preach to these people and, and as you can expect for somebody that was kind of well known at the time a lot of people came to hear him speak and was looking forward to an inspiring sermon so he, he walks up and he gets in front of them and this is what his sermon was had an ice storm last night Lots of trees are down, lots of poor people in this town. The electricity is off, and they got no heat. I've got my pickup outside, my chainsaw, and my wood axe. I'm going to cut some firewood from those trees to help those poor people. Who's going with me? And he stepped down from the pulpit and walked out the back doors of the church. And he left a bunch of mystified people sitting in their pews. 
Did anybody follow him down the aisle? The fact was that Will Campbell just didn't honor God with his lips. He honored God with his life, with his actions, with what he did, of how he committed to that. And y'all, we've seen some fantastic pictures of how, um, you know, our Methodist uh, umcor and our, our on the ground in places like Haiti. And even today, as we come together and worship, we know that there are people in the Louisiana area that are in grave danger. And there's going to be so much need to clean up after that storm. But I would say that more importantly than even that, in our normal, regular lives, that's when people need to see us living the life that God has called us to. You see, people expect people to do good things during really bad times, right? Uh, 9-11, we have a big anniversary of 9-11 coming up. Think about what happened after 9-11. We all pulled together and people did amazing things and showed amazing love. Even at the beginning of COVID and and we, when we said we really cared about our doctors and our nurses, and we, we called them heroes. And we did that because it seemingly is easier to do stuff like that during great times of need. The problem we run into is we lose out on the fact that we live every day in a time of great need. That people in our community, without there being storms or uh, crime or explosions or fighting or any of that stuff without even any of that stuff we are in a desperate time of need people need to experience the love of Jesus Christ and the way they will experience that will not be with our words it will not be with us telling them about Jesus it's going to be showing them through our love and acting out in a way that demonstrates that love, even during the times that we are in need. So for us, we honor God, we honor Christ, and we show others what it means to live by acting in a way that honors God and honors Christ. Yeah, we're still going to be hypocrites sometimes. We're still going to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. But people can see our genuosity. If they realize that we genuinely love others because God loved us first, yeah, maybe we might just be able to make a difference. And maybe somebody will run into heaven and they'll walk up to us and say, you know what? It's because of your unselfish love that I was able to experience the love of Christ. Boy, won't that be a day. God bless you. Amen.
I pray today's worship service has been a blessing to you. More importantly, though, I pray that as you go from this place, you'll realize that you have the, the opportunity, the power, um, and the privilege of sharing God's love with others. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to backpedal. We're all going to be hypocrites in the way that we act at times. But I truly believe that we, if we would recommit ourselves, maybe each morning as we woke up, if our prayer would simply be, Lord, allow me to represent you to the world, then maybe we can make a difference in this world. And maybe others can come to see where we get our strength and where we get our power from. May God bless you. May you continue to remember how much that God loves you and how much that I love you. And may you always give God the glory. Amen. Mm -hmm.